Hi everyone, welcome back to English 112. This is for our class for Tuesday, the 24th. And as you know, our first paper is coming up. I have a due date of approximately midway through the semester. For us, that would get us to about the 26th of October, which is this upcoming Thursday. So I'm hopeful that if you haven't already submitted in your paper, and thank you to those of you who already have, that you will be shortly. And ultimately, as you know, everybody has the option of rewriting that first paper. So after I've evaluated the paper and I've given you a letter grade, after I've reviewed it for grammar and mechanics, returned it back to you, then you can redo it for a higher grade, taking my comments into account, and then I just ask that you submit in the original with my graded, uh, with my commentary on it, along with your revision that you incorporate my comments. If you need further direction, please let me know. And then I can compare and contrast the two and you would get the higher of the two grades. And that said, you have up until the ending of the semester to do that, but the earlier the better for everybody involved. And what I will be doing is just working my way through papers in order of receipt. So first come, first serve. So do know you're in the queue, so to speak, but you'll certainly get your papers back in enough time for you to rewrite them. Now, paper number two is going to be very similar to paper number one, asking you to either talk about canon or to talk about um, contemporary relevance. But in this instance, you would be talking about drama, which is the unit that we are addressing right now in class. So in terms of the second paper that's due at the very ending of the semester, you probably wouldn't have time to rewrite it. But then again, your first play paper, I see it as the learning exercise so that you would already know how to write a paper when you are putting together your second paper. That said, occasionally I've had students who've been able to hand in their second paper early enough so that we could negotiate a uh, possible revision, but it's not guaranteed. A lot of it just depends on, on due dates and my workload. So that said, everybody has the option of rewriting the first paper. So you could see it as a kind of draft if you so wanted to. Now, where we are is talking about Oedipus the King. And I had you watch a performance of Oedipus the King that tried to give a sense as to what we might have experienced in a Greek amphitheater. So it would be a very different kind of experience than watching it, obviously, in a contemporary theater. That said, they did put um, the action of the play on a stage and used close-ups. I wish they hadn't have done that. I think that if the camera had been farther away, you would have gotten a more realistic sense of what it was that we might have experienced if we were watching the drama unfold. So what seems to be very exaggerated wouldn't necessarily seem exaggerated if we are in a 14,000 seat amphitheater. And of course, being able to see those padded costumes that I was talking about with the platform shoes and those large masks and the chorus who would be chanting in unison, almost providing a kind of soundtrack, if you will. The chorus serving both as commentators of the action, so they could be a, a viewed as a kind of narrator, but they would also be representatives of the community themselves itself, so you could see them as extras. And all of that gives you a sense of, if nothing else, the ability to use color imagery. This production uses color imagery, I think, quite cleverly. Again, we don't have eyewitnesses to be able to verify the authenticity of that production. But we did see how we had Oedipus dressed in regal gold and Jocasta was in silver, indicating that she was also regal, but one level down. And Creon being in bronze, yet a level further down, but also the color of royalty. We saw how the costume change at the very ending with Oedipus in red would denote the blood that he spilled in gouging out his eyes. It could also symbolize the anger that he illustrated, um, the quick temper that he illustrated throughout the play. I uh, also note that 
Oedipus's daughters are in red because they are the products of a blood crime, in effect, incest. So uh, I think that all of those colors work very nicely. Tiresias, the blind prophet, is all in white because he has insight, but he has very large black hollowed out eyes to indicate that he's physically blind. The character who also has black, large, hollowed eyed eyes is Oedipus, though not not of the same size as Tiresias. To illustrate that Oedipus has physical sight, yes, but he does not have insight, which is something that Oedipus gains by the ending of the play. And all of those exaggerated movements, and sometimes it, it actually looks like they're in stop motion, like they're posing, would have seen much more realistic in a Greek amphitheater where we might be in the back row of a 14,000 seat amphitheater where we would probably not see very much, which is why it was so important that we know the plot ahead of time so that we wouldn't have to rely on performance for the plot. And also um, what we could do is as we are consuming the drama is experience some of the themes rather than be too worried about the specifics because we would have already known the plot and of course that plot is such a tragic plot hence we have a tragedy the play beginning in media rest with oedipus who is a king uh, confronting a plague in his community and being a good king he wants to do everything within his power to solve that plague so he sends out all kinds of messengers to consult with oracles and prophets keep in mind this was a time of oracles and prophets the same answer keeps coming back that oedipus himself is responsible he refuses to believe it even when it's his own brother-in-law who he sent out to get information. And his brother-in-law, Creon, says, well, I was told that you, Oedipus, are responsible. Oedipus continues to deny, even accuse his brother-in-law of treason, trying to steal the kingdom from Oedipus. His brother-in-law says that's ridiculous, that ultimately he has all of the perks of and privileges associated with being in a royal family, but none of the responsibilities. And then as we get backstory revealed, we find out that Oedipus indeed is the cause of the plague and the anger of the gods. And the backstory goes all the way back to Oedipus's biological parents. And when Oedipus was a baby, the parents went to see an oracle and were told that their baby would grow to be a man who would kill his father and marry his mother. And the parents, horrified, give the baby to a shepherd to kill that child, one of their servants. And, of course, they wouldn't do it themselves, being a king or a queen. And the servant takes pity on Oedipus and, and leaves Oedipus. And Oedipus is ultimately uh, found abandoned on a hilltop and then is taken by someone else to another kingdom. A kingdom with a king and queen who do not have children and are unable to have children. So they're thrilled to see the baby and raise that baby as their own child and never tell Oedipus that he was adopted. So when this child grows up to be a man and consults the Oracle, this child Oedipus, now a man, um, is told by the Oracle that he will one day kill his father, marry his mother. And Oedipus is horrified by this and does everything within his power to try to prevent it and what he does is he tries to put as much physical distance between himself and his mother and father, not realizing that his mother and father are not his biological parents. And during Oedipus's travels, he happens to come across a crossroads and in a fit of rage because someone is blocking his way. Um, I almost get, get, think about modern road rage incidents. Um, Oedipus slays everyone, um, and it turns out that everyone included, well, his biological father. And then Oedipus continues on to a community that, yes, has recently lost its king. And that said, even though there are clues, Oedipus doesn't pick up on the clues. And, and what he does is he saves that community um, from horrible tragedy because they are also ravaged by plague, this time because of a horrific monster named the Sphinx that has given a riddle that needs to be solved. And no one is able to solve the riddle. 
except for Oedipus showing his superior intelligence. What walks on four legs in the morning? And the answer would be a baby crawling, morning representing the early part of life. And what walks on two legs in the afternoon? And that would be adulthood walking upright on two legs, afternoon being the height of life. And what walks on three legs in the evening, the evening being old age. And that would represent um, somebody who's walking with the king. Oedipus solves this riddle um, and ultimately is not only given the kingdom because the king was recently killed, but also the newly widowed queen. And they marry and have children. And ultimately those children are the products of incest, which is why the gods are so angered. And eventually Oedipus needs to accept this truth, even though he denies it from everybody, including Tiresias, the blind prophet, um, the prophet who is physically blind but has insight. And the response is that Jocasta is so horrified when the truth is revealed, of course she didn't realize ahead of time, um, or she never would have um, consummated her relationship with Oedipus nor married him. She commits suicide. And Oedipus, instead, what he does is he gouges out his eyes, the eyes that have betrayed him. And now, and so it works very nicely thematically. And now, in, in irony of all ironies, it turns out his brother-in-law, whom Oedipus had treated so badly, is now king and is willing to show Oedipus some mercy and allow Oedipus to say goodbye to his daughters. Oedipus is particularly concerned with his daughters slash sisters because they are women, so they aren't going to be able to fend for themselves in adulthood, because who will marry the products of incest? At least the boys will become men and be able to support themselves. And then Oedipus wanders off, actually fulfilling the riddle, walking on three legs. But it's not because he's old, it's because he's blind, so he needs a cane to find his way. And this is part of a three-part story. We're just reading the first part, Oedipus. The second part is the story of one of his grown daughters, Antigone. And we see Creon again. This time he's been king for quite a while. And he's much like Oedipus. He's filled with arrogance and hubris and pride. So one wonders what the position of king and ruler does to an individual to change them. The third play... And I believe the second play is in your textbook, Antigone, but the third play is not. The third play is Oedipus at Colonus, and Oedipus is basically wandering, has been for years, um, blind with his cane. The question is, has he atoned for his sins? Will the gods forgive him? And you'll have to read the plays or watch performances in order to find out what happens. But for the first play, Oedipus the King, we talked about how significant it was because it really helped to establish the tradition of tragedy. And that Aristotle, the great philosopher, also served as a kind of literary critic, laying out what those criteria should be. That a tragedy should be complex, of course, it's a piece of literature. It should be terrible, of course, because it's tragic. And it should be piteous. And that we should have a tragic hero, a great man above and beyond the ordinary someone we admire, someone beyond our capabilities, who experiences downfall because of flaw or flaws of character. And usually that includes pride, but it's not necessarily limited to pride. But there are also outside forces, whether you call them fate or destiny or luck, things outside of our control. And the tragic hero accepts responsibility for the part that they played in their descent. And we feel pity for the tragic hero. After all, they aren't completely responsible and they were good people. We also feel fear that if this could happen to the tragic hero and they're so much superior to us, then it could happen to us and it would be much, much worse. And of course, we know how Sigmund Freud was inspired, albeit loosely, to come up with his Oedipal complex. Obviously, the play is different than Freud's theory. In Freud's theory, every boy has a subconscious desire to be with their mother. And every girl in the Electra complex has a subconscious desire to be with their father. Um, obviously, that's not what happened in Oedipus the King. This was not conscious nor subconscious. In fact, the great irony of the play is that the characters try to outwit their destiny or their fate. And every action they take to try to prevent their destiny or fate from coming true actually makes it come true which is one of the most difficult things I think about understanding this play in contemporary times. Because as a contemporary audience, we see this play and we listen to this play 
And of course, we're watching and listening to translations because it was written originally in the Greek. And what we come up with is that, of course, anybody who's given a horrific prophecy that they will end up or a son will end up killing and then ultimately marrying a family member, um, you would do anything within your power to stop that. And that's part of our modern day conception of what our responsibility is. It would have been different during this time period, a time period of the gods where one should humbly accept one's fate and not try to outwit the gods because that would be the supreme arrogance in trying to outwit the gods' fate. And in fact, it is because Oedipus and his birth parents try to change their fates that their fates come about, which leads to the question, if they hadn't have taken any action, would this have ever happened? It almost reminds me of one of those time travel stories that, you know, you can get kind of lost in loop and thinking about the possibilities. But if we think about Oedipus as a great man, he's royalty, so that makes him great. He's a great riddle solver, so he's smarter than everybody else. And he's concerned with the populace. At the beginning of the play, his major concern is solving the issue that they have so that the plague can be eliminated and people won't suffer. At the ending of the play, Oedipus is willing to accept responsibility for his fall. And this is quite unlike Jocasta. She'd rather keep it a secret rather than have it be revealed the sin that Oedipus and she and the entire family has committed. In other words, Oedipus, uh, Jocasta is willing to sacrifice the populace to protect herself and her immediate family, while Oedipus is willing to expose himself and his immediate family to protect the populace. Oedipus does what a good ruler is supposed to do. And we certainly see downfall. I mean, uh, a story of plague, a story of incest, a story of exile, um, suicide, um, um, uh, uh, all of that indicates downfall. Outside forces, this would be fate or destiny. And this leads to some philosophical questions. If something is fated, does that mean that it's more than just predetermined, that there is no individual free will? And even though we'd like to believe we have free will, we basically are acting out if you will, something that has already been determined for us and that, that something is our life. And religions and philosophy struggle with this question. They oftentimes take a middle ground that there is predestination. There is, there is a sense of, of, of um, a, a level of foreknowledge, but it isn't necessarily fixed that it can be changed through free will is usually the middle ground. But in this particular play, what we see is individuals who very clearly try to defy the gods for good reason, obviously. Who wants this tragedy to occur? But it is their hubris, their arrogance in trying to defy the gods that actually brings about their punishment. And if they hadn't have defied the gods, would this have even happened? And of course, we know that what happened is absolutely horrific, that it resulted in the death of Oedipus's father, the murder of Oedipus's father, and Oedipus marrying his own mother and having children with her. So we have outside forces. Oftentimes in contemporary society, we talk about these things such as luck. Flaws in Oedipus's character, and, and this was something that I had asked you to contemplate earlier, lots of them. Certainly he has hubris, excessive pride. Just the fact that he tries to outwit the gods or the fact that he refuses to believe that he could be responsible. Definitely, he's filled with anger. I love the production where he is basically wailing and waving his arms saying, and I kill them all. Obviously, he has anger issues. And anger is definitely one of his flaws, as we see when he slays everybody at the crossroads. Paranoia, as he assumes that everybody is against him. And denial. And denial makes people blind to what's so obvious. And vision and blindness are major themes in this drama. But Oedipus, to his credit, accepts responsibility. He doesn't take the coward's way out, which is what Jocasta would be viewed as doing, by committing suicide and not living with the pain in this life of her actions. So... Basically, Oedipus will continue to live on in exile, and exile would be the worst thing next to death. 
And prior to that, he gouges out his eyes, so he self-mutilates. And it works so wonderfully thematically because this entire play has been about vision and blindness, about light and dark. So those are major themes in the play. And as audience, yes, we do pity Oedipus because he was a good man and he tried his best to prevent something horrible from happening. And we also feel fear because if this can happen to Oedipus and he's royalty and we're not, and he was able to solve the riddle of the Sphinx and we probably couldn't, then chances are I've, our downfall would be even greater than Oedipus's. And I can, I can tell you that the moral lesson, or one of the moral lessons on, a, on the most simplistic of levels is don't engage in Oedipus's flaws. And I know that as contemporary audiences, we're tempted to find the loophole, the if only. If only Oedipus's adopted parents had told him that he was adopted. If only Oedipus's birth parents had killed Oedipus themselves. If only Oedipus had decided as a man to never kill anyone or never marry anyone. You get the idea. I do it myself. But that's contemporary thinking. That's not the thinking that would be supported in Greek society. In fact, that would just be seen as more hubris, another attempt to outwit the gods. And we see how badly Oedipus was punished for doing that. So can you imagine how badly we would be punished for doing that? So Jocasta could never be considered a tragic hero, even though she's royalty, because she's really not concerned with the populace. And by the ending of the play, she'd rather that the secret go unsolved, the mystery go unsolved, than it be revealed and the tragedy that is going to occur to her and her nuclear family occur. And as, as someone who commits suicide, she refuses to live up to her, the pain that her um, actions have taken uh, or the pain that her actions have caused on others. Um, instead of facing that in her own lifetime, she decides to depart in an unnatural way. Creon, the brother-in-law, and we don't get a whole lot of him. He's really more of a character to represent certain traits, almost like an allegorical figure where he represents reason, rationality, and generosity. Again, the Creon we get in the next play, Antigone, is a very different kind of Creon. But at this point, he's been acting as a ruler for many, many years, which leads to questions of what does rulership do to individuals. And Tiresias also is really supposed to represent something we don't really have character development. Honestly, we don't really have character development for any of these characters. Not in the way we will when we get to Shakespeare, certainly. Um... Tiresias shows great irony that he's blind physically, but he has insight and the irony at the ending of the play that Oedipus is blind at the ending of the play, but now finally he has insight. And because we know the plot ahead of time, we can appreciate all the irony throughout the play. So even at the beginning, when Oedipus says things like he would even punish himself if he were guilty, we know that he is guilty. We know what Oedipus doesn't. And of course, you know, the populace, it serves, or the chorus serves as the populace, the community that's suffering, but also as the narrator so they can comment and reiterate on the action and some of the major themes, as I suggested, vision and blindness, or light and dark imagery, or something like irony. And this play is actually quite known for its use of irony, not to say that other pieces of literature don't use irony as well, but perhaps Oedipus is best known for the use of irony. Again, so important that we would know the plot ahead of time. And that tragic hero and the definition that I had given you and some of the themes lead to questions about, or at least observations about quotes, which is where I'm going to leave you today because I'm aware that many of you are still working with the paper. So, as we've talked about, vision and blindness is important. Light and dark is, is important. Irony is important. All of these might be possibilities for paper topics, but of course you would want to have them approved by me if you're not choosing the topics that I'm going to be offering you, which will be about either canon or contemporary relevance. Fate versus free will, as I was suggesting earlier, or even family, and that the community for king or queen, the community is supposed to be their family and they have a responsibility to care for it. 
And then, of course, there's the nuclear family. And we know that Jocasta cares just for her nuclear family, not necessarily for her family of community, which is why she can never be considered a good person and, or a great person, a tragic hero above and beyond the ordinary, unlike Oedipus. But there are quite a few quotes in the play that might illustrate some of these themes or concepts that I've been talking about thus far. So that will be today's attendance question, which will be due on Thursday the 26th. And as always, if you need an extension, please let me know. This is on our class discussion forum. For you to select one quote from Oedipus the King and indicate why you think it's an important quote. I'm not even asking you to identify an important quote. I'm only asking you to identify a quote that you think is important. What I'll do next class is I'll review those quotes and I might add in a few of my own so that we can put some closure to Oedipus the King. And then we can begin with Shakespeare. So we're slightly behind, but not very much behind. We should be able to catch up soon. So I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. And we will continue on next class as we transition away from Oedipus and move into Shakespeare. And I look forward to reading your papers sent to my email, ruiz, R-U-I-Z, at gcc.mass.edu via PDF, because that's how my grading program works. Again, I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. And I'll see you next class. Take care. Bye-bye.